Many of us are interested in unsolved mysteries. Some of these mysteries have been explained as the years have passed, and even more have been met with a general consensus as to their cause. Yet, there are several strange mysteries that have yet to be solved in the modern day, and it's these impossible to explain enigmas that have left us wanting answers. Soldiers turned into stone by cosmic beings. They say that truth is stranger than fiction. It's no secret that there are many strange things going on in our world that the general public will never know about, and we only hear about these things when officials decide to go on record and detail them, which helps us to better understand how we are truly left in the dark about some subjects. The argument could be made that sometimes this is for the best. However, others who have an interest in mysterious topics have often voiced their opinion about how they would love to know more. This is where the Freedom of Information Act comes in, and in recent years, it's helped online researchers uncover some bizarre and mysterious events. For those unaware, the Freedom of Information Act is a federal law that provides individuals with the right to access information held by government agencies. It was signed into law in 1966 with the goal of increasing transparency and accountability of the government to the public. Under the Freedom of Information Act, anyone can request access to records and information held by federal agencies, including documents, reports, and data. However, there are certain exemptions to the law, such as information that would compromise national security, personal privacy, or confidential business information. Freedom of Information Act requests must be made in writing, and agencies are required to respond to them within 20 business days. The Freedom of Information Act has been instrumental in promoting government transparency and facilitating investigative journalism. It has been used to uncover a wide range of information, from historical documents to details about government policies and procedures. Interestingly, in recent years, hundreds of thousands of documents have been published online, some of which have been done without the public's knowledge. There's some laws that state that officials have to release documents every couple of decades or so. One of these written laws in the United Kingdom is that of the 30-year rule, which states that certain government documents have to be released to the public 30 years after they were created. Due to hundreds of thousands of documents being released online in recent years, people are constantly finding strange writings that go on to detail mysterious events. And although many of them are not of interest and detail general administration work, some have caught people's attention. One such document goes into detail about 23 soldiers that were taken by five humanoid creatures. And this was after an encounter went wrong in Siberia back in 1993. The document details the following. After Mikhail Gorbachev dissolved in 1991, the KGB Top Secret Intelligence Administration, a lot of material from that department found their way abroad, in particular to the CIA. As reported by the authoritative magazine, U.S. intelligence obtained a 250-page file on the attack of a UFO on a military unit in Siberia. The file contains not only many documentary photographs and drawings, but also testimonies by actual participants in the events. One of the Central Intelligence Agency representatives referred to this case as a horrific picture of revenge on the part of extraterrestrial creatures, a picture that makes one's blood freeze. According to the KGB material, a quite low-flying spaceship in the shape of a saucer appeared above a military unit that was conducting routine training maneuvers. For unknown reasons, someone unexpectedly launched a surface-to-air missile and it hit the UFO. It fell to Earth not far away, and five short humanoids with large heads and large black eyes emerged from it. It is stated in the testimonies by the two soldiers who remained alive that, after freeing themselves from the debris, the aliens came close together and then merged into a single object that acquired a spherical shape. That object began to buzz and hiss sharply and then became brilliant white. In a few seconds, the spheres grew much bigger and exploded by flaring up with an extremely bright light. At that very instant, 23 soldiers who had watched the phenomenon turned into stone poles. Only two soldiers who stood in the shade and were less exposed to the luminous explosion survived. The KGB report goes on to say that the remains of the UFO and the petrified soldiers were transferred to a secret scientific research institution near Moscow. Specialists assume that a source of energy that is still unknown to Earthlings instantly changes the structure of the soldiers' living organisms, having transformed it into a substance whose molecular composition is no different from that of limestone. A Central Intelligence Agency representative stated, 
If the KGB file corresponds to reality, this is an extremely menacing case. The aliens possess such weapons and technology that go beyond all our assumptions. They can stand up for themselves if attacked. End quote. People were surprised when they read this document, saying that it's the proof that they've been looking for. Another thing people noticed was that the central intelligence agencies didn't dismiss this mysterious encounter. This document can be found on the official Central Intelligence Agency website. The next mystery we'll be covering is one of the most bizarre disappearances reported from the state of Idaho. Back in 1953, a mysterious disappearance would take place in the state of Idaho, only 18 miles from the small town of Wallace, that would lead many investigators involved in the case, wondering what caused the individual to pass away. Although some would spread the rumor that a large beast must have taken out 22-year-old Lamar Pepmuller during a routine hunting trip in the area, autopsy reports would find evidence of something far stranger and far more difficult to explain. According to the official investigation reports, back in November of 1953, Lamar Pepmuller would begin planning a hunting trip in an area he had often frequented in the past. Located only 18 miles southwest of his small town, 22-year-old Lamar had often visited the location on several different deer hunting expeditions and had become greatly familiar with the region. Excluding his experience and familiarity with the area, despite being only 22 years old, Lamar had almost a decade of hunting experience under his belt. Lamar's wife would later tell investigators that the outdoors were like a second home to Mr. Pepmuller, as he would often spend his free time hunting, camping or hiking in secluded areas wherever they were. It would be on the 21st of November that Lamar Pepmuller would go on his planned deer hunting trip during the early morning and tell his wife that he would either be back later in the day or on the following morning. According to the wife, Lamar planned a day hunting in the Slate Creek area, south of their small town of Wallace, Idaho. However, by nightfall, Lamar would fail to return home, causing his wife, Mrs. Pepmuller, to grow increasingly concerned. By that following morning, Lamar would fail to show up by the mid-afternoon, prompting his wife to contact the local law enforcement on the 22nd of November and file a missing persons report. As search and rescue volunteers and law enforcement agencies came together to begin a massive search and rescue operation for Lamar Pepmuller, a sudden cold front would manifest in the area, leading to a sudden powerful blizzard covering the region in a thick layer of fresh snow. Oddly enough, Weather reports claimed that the weather should have remained clear with possible light showers for another two weeks, but official storm reports during the blizzard would claim that more than 20 inches of snow were deposited over the course of three days. However, even more problematic, search and rescue volunteers would conduct the search for Lamar Pepmuller over a much larger area than typically established, due to the fact that Lamar's vehicle had never been recovered and his exact camping location was never known. Despite the troubles with the weather and the massive search grid, law enforcement agencies would continue with their combined efforts to search for Lamar Pepmuller during the snowstorm. After a day of searching, more than 60 volunteers would be in the area, including close friends and family of Lamar Pepmuller, several dozen sheriff deputies from adjacent departments, and another few dozen Forest Service personnel. Despite the large number of volunteers, it would take another four days after Lamar's disappearance for the search and rescue teams to locate Lamar's missing vehicle. This was after the snowstorm would come to an end, and more than 20 inches of snow were deposited in the area. Oddly enough, investigators had been worried that large bloodstains around the vehicle may have been evidence of a possible animal attack, but it soon became apparent to the investigators that the cause of the blood was the discovery of half of a large deer carcass placed beside Lamar's vehicle. The other half of the carcass was nowhere to be found. Once the vehicle was discovered, the search grid would begin to reconverge on the immediate area surrounding the vehicle, leading the volunteers to search in a radiating circular pattern from Lamar's car in all directions. After only a few hours following their discovery of Lamar's vehicle, he would be discovered on the 25th of November, 1953. According to the investigators involved in the Lamar Pepmuller case, Law enforcement had originally believed that Pepmuller had been the victim of a possible extermination in the area, as his missing vehicle pointed to possible evidence of a slaying and subsequent grand theft auto. However, after Lamar's vehicle was discovered, sheriffs started to believe that perhaps Lamar had suffered an accident or possible animal attack, 
as his vast experience with the outdoors made it incredibly difficult to believe that he had merely gotten lost in the area. Additionally, the region where Lamar Pepmuller was believed to have disappeared was considered easy terrain and would have been remarkably easy to reorient yourself from with even minimal outdoors experience. The discovery of Lamar and his position, alongside his vast outdoors experience, would make investigators suspicious that something far more unnatural had been responsible for his disappearance. Lamar would be found protruding from the fresh snow less than a mile from his vehicle. On Lamar's back would be a large, empty backboard, as if he had been carrying a large deer, but no deer was found except for small stains from an animal. Investigators would search the immediate area for another mile, but would be unable to find any sign of the missing half of the deer carcass, and believed that Lamar could have been taken out by a large animal that stole the deer carcass while it was still on his back. Oddly enough, investigators would soon realize that several of Lamar's belongings were also missing from his vehicle and his body, including his rifle and hunting equipment, but would fail to comment on these missing items and instead believed that Lamar was most likely attacked by an animal or that no signs of foul play were evident. However, members of the community would begin to float a series of strange rumors throughout the area following the discovery of Lamar and several actions taken by local sheriff departments and the county coroner's office. According to family members of Lamar Pepmuller, the county coroner's office had been at the centre of a possible cover-up into the passing of Lamar, as they would report that after seeing Lamar at the funeral home, they would pronounce that he had passed away from a heart attack, without any investigation or autopsy taking place. The official statement later provided by Coroner H. Mowry would claim that Lamar Pepmuller had become extremely exhausted while hunting and collapsed to the ground and passed away from a sudden heart attack. Despite the fact that no autopsy had ever taken place and would never be conducted, the coroner's explanation would make no sense, as Lamar had been an incredibly healthy and fit individual and at the time was only 22 years old. Additionally, Lamar had not been hunting at the time of his sudden passing, as he had merely been transporting half of the animal back to his vehicle only a short distance away. As of right now, there's still many that believe that something bizarre happened. The Unsolved Mystery of the Grafton Monster. The Grafton Monster is claimed to be a massive humanoid bipedal creature, white in color, with smooth, oily skin. The skin of the creature is believed to be a texture similar to that of a seal. The height of the monster is estimated to have been somewhere between seven to nine feet tall, and with a body roughly four feet in width. According to witnesses, the creature did not have a discernible head of any kind. It demonstrated no violent tendencies or notable behavior of any kind. Given the large size of the creature and the string of witness reports that consistently claim the creature to have been spotted by the Mississippi River or one of its tributaries, it's believed that the creature would use a network of river systems to travel up and down the entirety of the United States. On the 16th of June, back in 1964, estimated to have occurred sometime around 11 in the evening, reporter Robert Cockrell claimed to have been driving home from the Grafton Sentinel, a local newspaper office, driving through Beach Street and crossing over the Tigart River Bridge, when he noticed something peculiar at the side of the road. According to Robert, as he turned onto Riverside Drive directly off of the Tigart Bridge, he noticed something he described as huge and white, off to the side of the road along the river, where an old rock quarry had been dug out several decades beforehand. The reporter originally believed that the object could have been a large piece of rock that had washed up from the force of the river, disturbing the riverbank in an awkward way. Slowing down to get a better look, Robert Cockrell stopped completely next to the large white mass and realized that the object was not a piece of rock or lifted part of the riverbank, but was what he described as a living entity, white in color, with smooth, oily skin, with a texture that reminded him of a seal. The height of the creature was estimated by Robert Cockrell from a sitting position to have been somewhere between seven to nine feet tall and with a body roughly four feet in width. According to Robert, the creature did not have a discernible head of any kind. Robert Cockrell then began to drive away while staring at the creature, and remarked that at no time during his viewing of the creature did it make any kind of movement, and it was difficult for Cockrell to be certain that the object was indeed a living creature outside of the seal-like texture of its skin. Although reports differ, Cockrell's direct report made no mention of horror or fear when it came to his emotional state directly following the creature. Once Cockrell arrived home, he phoned several of his friends about the incident, 
and related to them that the strange sighting should be investigated, but that he did not feel safe returning to the site alone and wanted additional witnesses to his encounter. After several minutes of calling, the group met up at the location of the sighting and began to inspect the area for any signs or clues of the creature. Unfortunately, the creature had already disappeared, and the group had only discovered that the grass along the riverbank where the creature had been spotted had been completely matted down, as if a large object had rolled through the area. The group would continue searching along the side of the river, up and down the nearby road, near the edge of the woods, but were unable to locate the creature or object. Several members of the group claimed that they could hear a low whistling sound coming from somewhere nearby, but were unable to locate the exact area responsible for the source of the sound. On the 17th of June, the morning following the night of the sighting, Robert Cockrell would go to the local police station and report what he had experienced the night before. But the incident was completely disregarded by the law enforcement, who believed that the reporter had been making up the incident for publicity. Frustrated by the response taken on the part of the police officers, Robert Cockrell would tell the newspaper editor about his story, who then provided Cockrell with the green light to write up a short article about the incident. On the night of the 17th of June, Jim Mouser and Jerry Morse, two of the men who had accompanied Robert Cockrell on his late-night search of the creature immediately following his sighting, a mass panic would overcome the Grafton citizens. It's believed that both of the men would tell friends, family members and co-workers about Robert Cockrell's sighting all throughout the day. Due to Grafton having been a small and well-connected town, the story spread through the citizens long before the publication of the article by the Grafton Sentinel. Although there are conflicting reports, it's believed that on the night of the 17th, citizens of Grafton engaged in a monster hunt and flocked together into an armed mob and went up and down the Tigert River, searching for the monster. George Dudding, an investigator and author of The Grafton Monster, would describe the mob during his investigations into The Grafton Monster with the following quote. They grabbed whatever they could find to protect themselves, including pitchforks, mallets, tire irons, hammers, garden hose, crowbars, hatchets, and baseball bats. If anyone knows about citizens of West Virginia, there is no doubt that some were toting some heavy-duty artillery that night. End quote. It's not entirely clear what the mob had hoped to accomplish, as witness testimony of the event claimed that the majority of people had gathered together somewhat in jest, or because they were curious as to the claims of Robert Cockrell. The original members of the mob were made up of a collection of teenagers and young men who wanted to prove that they were unafraid of the claims of the monsters, and so journeyed out to the side of the river to confront the monster, bringing along friends and girlfriends to witness their bravery. The mob was then joined by others who were more curious to see the creature for themselves, as supposed claims of unidentified objects, and peculiar lights in the sky had been made within the prior weeks leading up to the original Grafton sighting. Little evidence that the mob had formed for the sake of a monster hunt was made by this point in time, with only minor tools having been gathered together for small comfort, such as baseball bats, crowbars, tire irons, and garden hose. However, it did not take long for the crowd to become increasingly hostile and panicked. Eventually, members would join the crowd, believing that they were engaged in a monster hunt, and would come equipped with far bigger weaponry. The formation of a mob could have been a product of mass hysteria, or a joke that quickly got out of hand. It was at this point that local law enforcement became concerned that someone could get hurt from the panicked mob, and would later engage in tactics used to minimise the claims of the creature in a possible cover-up. Robert Cockrell would join the mob later into the evening and begin to question small groups of witnesses who would claim that they had also encountered the creature, which was now being referred to as the Headless Horror. Robert Cockrell would write a report involving 20 witnesses and their individual encounters with the creature, with the sightings clustered around the old rock quarry. On the 18th of June, 1964, the Grafton Sentinel would publish the article Teenage Monster Hunting Parties Latest Activity on Grafton Scene The newspaper article is clipped as follows. Teenage Monster Hunting Parties Latest Activity on Grafton Scene Want to go monster hunting? If so, just join the roving bands of teenagers who are apparently convinced that a monster exists and is roving in the section of Riverside Drive near the city stone quarry. Wednesday night, several bands of teenagers armed with flashlights, mallets, crowbars and the like 
were reported searching the Riverside Drive area. End quote. On the night of the 18th, the citizens of Grafton once again formed into a mob and went on another monster hunting party to search for and confront the elusive headless horror. However, due to the publication of the Grafton Sentinel, the second monster hunting party would become a hazard for the town as traffic would begin to back up the roadway. Due to the wide number of reports of the creature and the crowds of people forming to confront the creature, the West Virginia State Police, Taylor County Sheriff's Department and the Grafton Police Department would arrive at the Old Rock Quarry to conduct an investigation into the sightings of the creature. As the mob grew rowdy and traffic began to back up, law enforcement would end their investigation to monitor the activity and serve as traffic control. The St. Joseph, Missouri Sightings Located 800 miles away from the Robert Cockrell sighting, an unnamed witness claimed to have encountered the Grafton Monster alongside the Missouri River, one of the river tributaries of the Mississippi River. The following quotes are believed to have been taken from the St. Joseph, Missouri witness. I have seen the creature called the Grafton Monster several times when I was a young man, and it is very real. My first encounter was with my father cutting wood. We had finished loading the truck when our two dogs started barking. We stood there and listened. Something was walking, getting closer. Whatever it was had picked up its pace and continued toward us. All we knew for sure was, it was big and wasn't scared of us, the dogs, or the chainsaws. It stopped about 50 to 55 yards from us in the trees and went quiet. My dad pulled both hammers back and stood in front of me and told me to be ready. The next thing that happened, I'll never forget. It stepped out, looked at us, took three strides in our direction, turned, and walked back into the tree line. That was my first sighting of the beast, and I'll never forget it. My second encounter was about two months later at night, fishing alone. I spotted him on the opposite bank, and I got the hell out of the area. End quote. The Dewey Lake Monster Connection One week prior to the Grafton Monster sighting, six witnesses reported sighting a creature that would later be referred to as the Dewey Lake Monster. According to the witnesses, Mr. and Mrs. John Utrup, Patsy and Gail Clayton, Gordon Brown and Joyce Smith were visiting the Utrup farm, located south of Dewey Lake. The creature was described as being a bipedal humanoid creature, covered in hair from head to toe, standing upright at an estimated height of 10 feet, was believed to weigh 500 pounds and had luminous glowing eyes. Stories surrounding the creature relate that the Dewey Lake monster fit more accurately with descriptions and encounters of Sasquatch-like creatures and would eventually earn the name of Sister Lake's Sasquatch. Thirty separate additional sightings would take place from June 9th to June 11th, back in 1964. Several small rivers and tributaries connect the Dewey Lake with the Mississippi River. Gray Barker's Theory Robert Cockrell refused to accept natural explanations of any kind and became increasingly frustrated surrounding claims that the entire encounter had been a hoax. Desperate to prove himself, Robert Cockrell continued investigating the Grafton monster and would send letters to Gray Barker, a member of the International Flying Saucer Bureau, to assist him in his investigations. Gray Barker would join Robert Cockrell in his investigation and put forward the theory that the Grafton monster could have had an extraterrestrial origin. Barker believed that the Grafton monster could have been a test entity, a biological genetic creation created by the pilots of flying saucers to test whether or not the atmosphere was breathable to their species via genetic engineering. He believed that the whooshing or whistling sound could have been the sound emanated from a nearby saucer dropping the creature and then later returning to pick it up. Gray Barker had originally worked on developing a report to be published at a later time in the International Flying Saucer Bureau, but eventually hid the file and never published the written work. The reason for why Barker would abandon the investigation and refuse to publish the claims is unknown, though a plausible explanation could have been that he feared or discovered the event to have been a hoax. Others have said that this idea is highly unlikely, but have struggled to explain what residents witnessed during this time period. As of right now, what the creature is remains a mystery. Kent's Mystery Hitchhiker All around the world, there are impossible to explain stories of paranormal sightings involving a phantom hitchhiker standing at the side of the road. Although many of these stories are difficult to verify, with the sources behind their legends coming from friend-of-a-friend retellings, 
It appears that throughout Kent County, located in England, there are no shortages of first-person eyewitness encounters with many of these phantom hitchhikers. Near the town of Chatham, located within Kent County, is an often revered mystical location referred to as Bluebell Hill. Similar to the Chislehurst Caves, another place of supernatural connection, the hill appears to be made entirely out of naturally formed chalk deposits and has been at the centre of supernatural and spiritual eyewitness accounts. According to one of the legends surrounding the hill, the people of Chatham claim that back in 1970, a lone motorist had encountered a phantom hitchhiker that had entered his vehicle. As the legend details, sometime during the winter, an unnamed motorist was on his way home, passing through Chatham, when a sudden torrential downpour of rain made his car slow in anticipation of the road's conditions. Before long, the rain and the cool air revealed a horrifying thunderstorm that seemed to flash lightning at an increasingly rapid rate. A few minutes later, as the motorist was making his way around the area of Bluebell Hill, his vehicle neared to a complete stop. As he noticed a young woman standing at the side of the road, wearing what seemed to be a thin, flimsy white dress similar to a bridal gown. According to the driver, the woman had long, matted black hair, slumped shoulders, and was waving her hands at the driver frantically as her dress clung tightly to her body in the rain. Fearing that the woman was stranded or in trouble, the motorist came to a halt in front of the woman as he rolled down his car's passenger side window and asked if she needed a ride. Rather than verbally replying, the woman nodded solemnly and entered the back seat of the car. As she entered, she repeated to the driver to take her to her home located on one of the major Chatham roads, only a few minutes away. Although at several times during the trip, the motorist had attempted to make small talk with the woman, she appeared unable or unwilling to speak about any of the topics the man tried to broach with her, seemingly only repeating her home's address in a similar tone. Believing that the woman was merely traumatized by the whichever event caused her to be estranged alone at night in a torrential downpour, the motorist refused to press the issue further and drove in awkward silence until getting close to the address that she had repeated to him several times. Coming to a stop, the motorist turned to the woman in the back seat to tell her that she was home when he realized that she was no longer in the car. Frightened at first, the driver soon convinced himself that she must have exited the vehicle in a hurried panic as his car was slowing down and he must have failed to hear her exit the vehicle due to the violent thunderstorm outside. Upon closer inspection, the motorist noticed that a small woman's purse was resting in the back seat of his vehicle. Worried that the woman had forgotten her belongings, the man grabbed the purse and exited his vehicle while calling out for the woman. As he approached the home, he noticed that the lights in the house were off, as if no one had been awake or entered the home for a few hours. After knocking on the door and ringing the doorbell for a few minutes, the lights in the house came on, and an elderly couple came to the door. After explaining the situation to them and handing the elderly couple the missing purse, they continued to stare at him dumbfounded and in total silence. Creeped out by the encounter, the driver asked the couple what was wrong, to which they replied that the woman he had picked up matched the physical description of their daughter who had passed away in a car accident near Bluebell Hill during a thunderstorm, and that the handbag matched her missing purse from the incident. Although the veracity of the phantom hitchhiker claims are nearly impossible to prove, countless residents of Chatham swear by the story and claimed that the incident had occurred several different times in a variety of ways throughout the late 1960s and early 1970s. Interestingly enough, in another town several miles from Chatham, a similar phantom hitchhiker story is told by residents of one of the most haunted towns of the British Isles. According to Pluckley residents, the small town is considered to be one of the most haunted locations in all of the United Kingdom, if not the entire world. Located in Kent, Pluckley has been at the centre of just as many supernatural sightings as the region surrounding Bluebell Hill, with sightings of phantom black cats, Sasquatch-like creatures, unexplainable aerial lights, and bizarre paranormal occurrences. Such occurrences would include the spiritual encounter of Raymond Breakspear, a taxi driver who would handle late-night fares throughout Pluckley and the surrounding villages, often picking up rowdy passengers closer after midnight. According to Raymond, it was sometime at around 2.45 in the morning, while passing through the nearby roads leading into Pluckley, that Raymond saw a dark-clothed man standing at the side of the road, waving down passing vehicles. Raymond would later remark that the location of the man seemed eerily unusual, 
as many times those looking for a taxi are located more in the village or outside pubs, not several miles into the nearby countryside. Believing that perhaps the man had become stranded or was suffering an emergency, he pulled over to the side of the road and asked the man if he needed a ride. Rather than giving a straightforward reply, the man stared at Raymond Breakspear and repeated the unknown address several times that the taxi driver was unable to recognize. Worried that the man might have entered an altered conscious state due to some unknown emergency, Raymond would tell the man to get into the taxi and that he would help him find the address. After hearing these words, the strange man went towards the back door of the vehicle but appeared to have struggled to open the door several times. Quickly exiting the vehicle, Raymond opened the passenger side door and helped the man inside the back seat of the taxi. However, as he walked back to the driver's seat, Raymond remarked that he felt a terribly oppressive, eerily supernatural feeling in the air, as if he were being watched by a predator, or some unknown creature had been standing nearby. Once back in the vehicle and on the road, after about a mile, Raymond turned to the passenger to ask him where the mysterious address was located. Oddly enough, when Raymond turned to the passenger, he soon realized that no one was in the vehicle with him, despite having helped the man enter the vehicle and seeing him sitting in the back seat as he drove off down the road. Fearing that the man may have jumped out of the moving vehicle in order not to pay the taxi fare, the driver pulled over and glanced around, but failed to find any sign of the mysterious man. Remembering that the taxi cab locks while the vehicle is in motion to prevent passengers from skipping out on the fare, Raymond gets back into his vehicle and heads back into town out of fear of a far more supernatural cause. Several months later, while talking with several other taxi drivers, Raymond brings up the incident of the mysterious dark-clothed man, only to hear from several other drivers similar stories of phantom passengers, including women wearing white and men wearing dark clothing. Today, taxi drivers and motorists tell stories of unlocked car doors suddenly opening while driving through the surrounding Pluckley roads, or hearing the sound of a woman laughing while driving through the area late at night, as if an invisible woman were sitting in the back seat of your car. The 1850s Mass Sighting of the Kentish Ape Man of Kent County, England For as long as can be remembered, England's Kent County has been at the centre of a large number of supernatural reports and bizarre mythical sightings that are impossible to explain. None more so than the strange reports centred around a roaming Sasquatch-like creature referred to by residents of Kent as the Kentish Ape Man. According to eyewitness reports, the creature is described as being similar in design to a large baboon-type creature, though more in the shape of a man. Standing at a height of seven and a half feet to eight feet tall, the creature is claimed to be covered from head to toe in a brown or greyish fur, walks in a bipedal motion, and possesses the supernatural ability of disappearing completely from an open field, even when the region is surrounded by a search party. The earliest known reported sighting of the Kentish Ape Man was published back in 1858, in a local newspaper referred to as the Kentish Gazette. The article would describe a series of mass sightings that had persisted in the region over the span of several years throughout the mid-1850s to 1858. According to the Kentish Gazette, proof that a mysterious creature was wandering around Kent County was reported sometime during that year's harvesting season and would ultimately lead to an independent investigation from local authorities and interested journalists. Although several sightings had already been claimed, the primary sighting used as proof of the creature was reported by an unknown farm worker who had been tending to a wheat field referred to as Buck's Farm, located within Kent County, near a small village by the name of Great Chart. According to the Buck's farm worker, as he was gathering his wheat, he claimed to have spotted a seven and a half foot tall baboon-like creature that walked on its hind legs and appeared to have been covered in a brownish, orangish fur. The face of the creature appeared to have been smooth, and shown human-like eyes. At the sighting of the creature, the farm worker appeared to have entered a temporary state of fear-induced hysteria and fell to the ground, unable to move from his location until the creature left. Afterwards, the man claimed that he had great difficulty in moving, struggling to get over a fence that bordered the farm due to his affliction. The Kentish Gazette would detail the event with the following paragraph. Not knowing indeed whether it might not be certain unmentionable personage in bodily shape, its appearance had the effect utterly scattering his senses, and when he collected enough of them to make up his mind to a speedy retreat, fear had so unnerved his limbs that he was at first unable to get over a stile which led out of the field. He, however, 
at last did so, and we may suppose reached his home with his hair standing on end. End quote. Oddly enough, after the sighting of the creature, the field worker who had witnessed the creature would soon become terribly ill from an unknown disease. At the time of the illness, the Kentish Gazette reported that the field worker's deterioration was most likely a byproduct of the fright he had witnessed, though failed to describe any additional ailments that were inflicted. After hearing of the sighting, the article would describe that several large men from Great Chart would gather their weapons in search for the monster. After conducting a thorough search of the field and surrounding areas, the men gave up on the search, believing the creature to have disappeared into the thick brush of the nearby wilderness. Fearful that the creature might return, as witness sightings persisted in the area at the time, the men gathered together and travelled to another village known as Ashford, with a horse and carriage to gather a group of police officers to begin a more thorough search of the creature to hunt and eradicate the animal, or to bring it into custody if it was willing and intelligent. However, once in Ashford, the local authorities appeared dismissive of the reports and provided the official explanation that the creature was nothing more than an escaped baboon from a travelling zoo. Though no further mention of armed men engaged in hunting the creature is reported, several more sightings were recorded by the Kentish Gazette over the next few weeks. The article would detail the following paragraph on the series of sightings, leaving the information vague and mysterious. One party took a horse and cart and went to Ashford in order to bring back aid from the police in taking him into custody. Since then, it is reported that the animal, which is set down as a baboon escaped from some show, has been seen in several adjacent parishes, but we have not heard of its capture, or of any damage done by it, except indirectly, through persons trampling down the wheat in Mr. Greenhill's field while in search of it. End quote. The last reported sightings of the creature would be reported several weeks after the initial incident at Bucks's farm. The first would be reported by a young girl who claimed to have seen the creature on a Tuesday near the small town of Newgate Wood. According to the young girl, despite having been frightened by the creature, she had stayed and watched the monster for a considerable amount of time, allowing her to get a good look at the strange beast and its behaviours. The girl would claim that the creature stood at around eight feet in height, and was covered in a long fur that covered all around its body except for its face, which seemed remarkably human. The creature appeared to have had elongated, monkey-like arms and walked around like a human with a long gait. Before long, the creature would disappear into the surrounding wilderness. Later that same day, a shepherd who had journeyed with his sheep to an open grassy field claimed to have spotted the creature amongst his livestock, causing him to quit his job and return home immediately after his encounter. Given the creature's close proximity to the sheep, one last hunt for the monster was performed as local townsfolk began to worry that the monster could have been connected with the many different livestock disappearances recorded in the area. Utilising the entirety of the national school members and students, the group scoured the forests of the parish, but were unable to locate the creature anywhere in the region despite the many repeated sightings. In recent years, Many researchers have started to connect the sudden mass sightings of the Kentish ape-man creature with the unearthing of a series of networked tunnels discovered near the edges of Kent County, referred to as the Chislehurst Caves. According to a recent article published by the local news organisation of Kent County, known as Kent Live, the Chislehurst Caves have been at the centre of a wide number of supernatural rumours and theories dating back to their rediscovery in the early 1800s. Stretching for over 22 miles, the caves are made up of a complex, interconnected, maze-like series of tunnels that are all man-made in origin, and are believed to date back to a period prior to the oldest known human civilization. The earliest known record of written reference to the caves was recorded back during the early 9th century, in which a Saxon charter made reference to the caves, though was unaware of their size, as they had yet to be explored. However, this reference is only a recent recorded account of the caves, as the Vice President of the British Archaeological Association believes the caves to have been used as a place of significant religious and spiritual importance by the Druids, with many carvings into the side of the chalk caves seemingly being used as evidence of Druidic altars. Eerily enough, many of these ancient Druid carvings appear to depict human and monkey-like faces in the side of the walls. The Chislehurst Caves would not be rediscovered and used until the early 1830s to the 1860s, when local villages would use the chalk caves as a mining location to dig for chalk and lime. 
It's around this time that the reported sightings of the Kentish Ape Man would suddenly be recorded, alongside countless stories of supernatural sightings of ghost-like entities in the mines. The mines would then be closed around 1860, around the same time that the sightings of the Kentish Ape Man would halt. The cause for the closing of the mines was never recorded. Researchers believe that the entirety of Kent County may potentially house thousands of miles of more undiscovered man-made chalk cave systems more than 30 meters below its surface, given that the entire region is rich in chalk deposits that make an incredibly easy medium for carving complex stable tunnels. Additionally, one of the most peculiar aspects of the Chislehurst Caves are the strange vertical shafts that appear to descend directly into the caves that are difficult to locate from above ground, matching many of the early Kentish ape-man legends of the creature mysteriously sinking and disappearing into the ground. Even more troublesome today, the British Archaeological Association believes that the formation of the caves may have been prehistoric in nature, after the discovery of an ancient human skeleton estimated to be more than 10,000 years old, roughly around the time of the last Great Ice Age, and the beginning formation of northern civilizations. This could point to the theory that a small village of people lived within the caves as a shelter towards the end of the last ice age for an unknown period of time, though their timing would have placed their group in habitation long before the earliest known complex human civilizations. So, what do you make of these unsolved mysteries? Be sure to leave your questions and answers in the comment section below and help us to grow this community while working to solve these unexplained mysteries. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to subscribe for more videos.